good morning. My name is Robin Panimenta. Uh, I'm the head of technology at The Telegraph in London. Uh, and um, I'm very fortunate to have, us, to have with us here this morning Brian Halligan, um, the founder of HubSpot, um, a Bostonian and a guy who, in many ways, I think has kind of uh, lived the startup dream. Uh, uh, he started HubSpot in, in 2006 uh, as a class project uh, at MIT Sloan uh, with his business partner. Uh, and last year, I think you had revenues of nearly $400 million. Um, you're a $5.5 billion company, $6 billion company. Um, and um, you are undoubtedly uh, also passionate about what you do. Yes. Uh, so much so that you wrote a book, uh, Marketing Lessons from the Grateful Dead, which is a fantastic title, by the way, if I may <laughs> say so. Um, I wanted to start just by talking a little bit about, um, about trust. Uh, a few days ago, you may have noticed uh, Dictionary.com uh, named its uh, word of the year, uh, misinformation. Uh, this is what we in journalism used to call lies. <laughs> um, uh, and I think a lot has changed since 2006, both uh, online and in the real world, uh, politically, socially, uh, on social media. And, and a big part of that is you know, a kind of a crisis of, of trust in, in institutions, um, the mainstream media. Uh, in government, in companies, political parties. Um, how does that affect your world? And how does a company attract new customers uh, at a time when there's so little trust? Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. Uh, I think the whole world's in a crisis of trust, particularly Americans, like trust in government, trust in religion, trust in social media firms, trust in companies is at an absolute low. Like uh, There's a crisis in trust in the world. And how's that? affect sales and marketing, I think people trust sales and marketing less than ever. There's always been a sort of shaky trust between customers and sales and marketing. I think trust is at an all-time low in sales and marketing, and that makes it particularly hard if you're a startup trying to scale in this day and age, because the traditional sales and marketing playbook, they just don't seem to work anymore because the trust level is so, well, uh, so low. And I think, it's, uh, I think it's a whole new world we're living in, and a whole new way to scale your business has to emerge from this really lack of trust in the, in the whole world. Um, just looking at this, you know, this incredibly dynamic uh, scene here and the, you know, in, in Helsinki this week, um, we were talking earlier about um, how you know, the, the startup scene is, is incredibly vibrant uh, globally um, and clearly in, in the Nordics. Uh, you know, and, and partly this is because, in many ways, it's, it's easier than ever to, to start a business. Yeah. Um, access to capital, low interest rates, um, access to services like AWS. Um, the real challenge uh, is, is to actually scale businesses. So I just wanted to ask, you know, as someone who's, who's been on that journey and navigated it pretty successfully, what's your advice to, to people scale, here and yeah. to startups? Yeah. It's never been easier to start, and it's never been harder to scale. Uh, it's easy to start, like I think of a software company, if you're a software startup in the room, compared to 10 years ago. Today, you've got AWS, which is basically on demand and almost free. You've got open source software, which is basically free. Uh, you've got Starbucks or a WeWork, if you've got a little bit of money. You basically need very little capital to start. There's tons of angel money and venture capital. Interest rates are near zero. It is a fantastic time to start a company. And this startup vibe here at Slush seems to be happening all over the world. Whether you're in uh, Mumbai or Memphis, uh, you're seeing this real startup activity. Now, the good part of that is easy to start. The bad part is it's very hard to scale. You've got massive competition. Head starts in any given industry are quickly uh, you know, dissipated away by startups that are right on your tail. And I just think of my little company, HubSpot. Uh, you know, we started a long time ago, and when we started the company, uh, there were 14 marketing software companies in the entire planet. And today, you know how many marketing software companies there are in the planet? 6,000 is just an explosion of companies and startups out there. So it's never, ever been harder to scale. And I think there's got to be a whole new approach and a new playbook to thinking about how to grow these startups that you're all in into big scale-ups that go public one day, have thousands of employees and partners and, and customers. And uh, that kind of brings us to um, 
another idea of yours that I know you, you like to talk about, which is uh, this concept of funnels and, and flywheels. Yep. Um, you know, when you're scaling a business, obviously the, the kind of uh, you need to think about how to drive your, your sales. But but in many ways, uh, you know, the, the 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 world of sales and marketing has changed a lot over the yeah. past ten years. Yes. Um, and traditional ways of thinking about it are, are you know increasingly redundant. Can you just talk a little bit about sure. that? Sure. When I was back in business school, I had a, a really good professor. He used to say, you know, Brian, if you want to build a great company today. Your product's got to be 10 times better than the competition. It's really got to be way better than the competition. And I think about that advice is relatively dated at this point. Yes, your product needs to be better than the competition, but product advantages are generally short-lived because people can catch up so quickly. The new uh, version of that is your customer experience, I think, has to be 10 times better than your competition. And the really interesting companies these days aren't ones necessarily with better products, but with breakthrough business models, breakthrough customer experiences, breakthrough go-to-market models. And let me give you an example. Uh, on a typical day when I wake up in Boston, Massachusetts, I want to tell you about my morning routine. I wake up in the morning on my Casper mattress uh, and have a nice night's sleep. And then I go to my bed stand and I put on my Warby Parker glasses. And then I take out my phone and I put on uh, Spotify, and I listen to The Grateful Dead. I love The Grateful Dead, and I dance my way into the bathroom, and I shave with my Dollar Shave Club razor, uh, and then I put on my Trunk Club outfit. What do you think of my outfit today? Nice? Woo! Uh, and then I take an Uber to work. What's fascinating to me about my morning routine is all six of those vendors, they're all startups. They're all relatively new companies. They are all growing like a weed, and they've all completely disrupted the previous uh, generation of companies in that space. And they've done it not by making a better product. Uber's cars are the same as everyone else's cars. Warby Parker's glasses are the same as whatever glasses yours are really nice uh, are on. It's that the customer experience is better and lighter and more fluid. And uh, it's a whole new way to sell and market. And I think this starts in B2C and really spreads to B2B. So a whole new playbook is emerging for how to grow your startup into a scale up. And, and what about the, the role of the chief executive in this, in this kind of new startup world? Um, has, the, has the role of the CEO changed? Um, and is it, is it different to, to when you start out? I think it is. Uh, I think it's changed a lot. Uh, I just think the role of, of the corporation has changed. Like I think of, of this, if, if I'm the corporation and you're a customer, Robin, uh, the leverage has changed. Uh, like for me, when I first started out in business, like the way you would sell a product in, in the B2B world was you cold call into an account, a cold call into you. You used to have a phone on your desk. It didn't have caller ID. You might actually pick up your phone, which was really interesting, would have a chat and would start down the dance of a sales process. And you would ask me for things as the prospect. You'd ask me for product specs. You'd ask me to talk to my founder. You'd ask me for pricing information. Every time you asked me for something, I would get something back. I'd take my pound of flesh. And the relationship was asymmetric. I had the power over you, essentially, back in those days. And today, it's really flipped on its head where you have all the power. The buyer has all the power. And me, the vendor, the CEO, has very little power. If you want to connect to the founder of our company, connect on LinkedIn. If you want pricing information, it's on the website. If you want product information, it's on the website. Everything is there. And because it's so easy to start a company, and because supply and demand is so out of balance in almost every industry, things are really changing. And it's become a world where instead of it's buyer beware, it's seller beware. I'd be very careful about who I sell. Uh, almost every industry has moved to subscription base, so you can easily cancel. Almost every product you buy, you can complain about it on Twitter and Facebook and Snapchat, wherever you want to complain, G2 Crowd. The leverage has really shifted in the world, and the CEO's role has really changed as a result of that. And your go-to-market has to change to reflect those realities. Sure. And I think another, another area where we're seeing a lot of change, particularly at the moment, is uh, with employees. Yes. Um, and recently, we've seen a kind of big rise in, in employee activism. If you look at you know, some of the big Silicon Valley companies, yeah. uh, Google, et cetera. Um, why is that happening, and, and where, do you, where do you see it ending? Uh, I, I think it's quite similar. The relationship between myself, the company, and let's say you're the employee, 
that's also changed a lot. There used to be kind of a wall between the company and the employee, and that wall is knocked down. And in today's day and age, a couple things are happening. One, the internet knocks that wall down. Two, the supply and demand is way off. Like in Boston, for example, in the tech economy, unemployment rate is effectively zero. And so you as an employee can choose from any number of thousands of potential great workplaces in Boston or around the world. So the supply and demand is way off there. Uh, and I just think there's a lack of trust between employees and companies. Uh, they don't trust, like I said, they don't trust governments, they don't trust anybody. They certainly don't trust their employer. And so you're starting to see this play out in real life with what's going on with Google is very interesting where employees are far more aggressive, employees are speaking out, employees are really shaking things up. And I think that's the very beginning of it because uh, trust continues to fall, that supply and demand continues to fall because of all these macroeconomic forces. So as a CEO running a company, the worst thing you can do is fight these trends. You have to embrace the fact that actually your customers have a lot more power over you than ever. Your employees actually have a lot more power you, over you than ever. So you have to behave in a new and interesting and different way. And I think you're seeing that kind of play out. Wow, these are really, uh, and I think you're starting to see that play out. Like, the new CEOs that seem to be doing well, there's two I like a lot, who I'm trying to a little bit model, frankly, my behavior on, is Satya Nadella, the CEO of Microsoft, and Dara, uh, the CEO of Uber. They're, they're not founder CEOs, they're newly hired CEOs. They're real adults, they're very transparent, but they're transparent to their customers and their employees. They don't spend a lot of time talking to the press. They don't spend a lot of time beating their chest. They're very reasonable, down-to-earth people who engender trust. And I think the world is changing that way, and I think that role of the CEO is going to continue to evolve, and I think we're going to have more CEOs that look like Satya and Dara. Okay. Um, you've built quite a distinctive kind of culture at uh, yep. HubSpot. Um, and I wanted to ask you a little bit about that. I mean, um, so much so, in fact, that you actually got burned a little bit by a book by uh, Dan Lyons a, a couple of years ago. Why is investing in that culture important? And you know, what does it mean to you? Yes. Uh, I, I sort of think about most companies, they spend a lot of time on their product. Let's say you're sell selling this water bottle. It's a nice water bottle. Uh, you spend a lot of time in, in your company thinking about, how do I build a great product? How do I make it unique relative to the competition? Uh, and work and work and work on making the best product as unique and as compelling a value prop for that product to attract customers. I think in today's day and age, you need to think about your culture in a very, very similar way. You need your culture to be great in some ways, not in all ways, but in some ways, and be valuable to a certain part of the population and really, really compelling and unique relative to the competition. So when we're hiring engineers in Boston, every engineer we hire, we're competing with Google and Facebook and a million startups. So how do we make our value prop unique and, and really resonate with people? And what we did, which is largely work, but it's backfired in some ways, is we built something called a culture code, which is a 128 slide deck. It takes about 10 minutes to go through, which really outlines how we feel about the relationship between our company and our employees and how we think about our value to prop to our employees and how the employee-company uh, relationship really works. And that's been quite interesting. It's been a magnet that pulls employees in. It's made us unique relative to the competition as far as that's gone. And it's been very powerful. So I think almost all companies out there, if you want to go from startup to scale up, you're going to have to hire like crazy. I mean, we've got 2,600 employees. You just got to hire. You're always hiring, constantly hiring. We're hiring hundreds and hundreds of employees a year, and you got to hire the best employees you can. Almost every industry is all about the employees. And so you got to be very thoughtful and conscious about your culture, make it unique from the competition, and you got to kind of write it down and use it as a magnet to pull people in and hopefully repel people that you don't want. And um, we've, we've talked a lot about the, the sort of culture of startups. Is there a kind of... Um, single most important lesson that you've learned uh, in, in your journey since starting a company in 2006 that you wish you'd learned earlier on or that you wish you'd known when you set out? Yeah, one thing about the culture that we learned the hard way uh, is when we started our company, we hired lots and lots of people who were classmates of ours at MIT. And I think something like 18 of our first 20 people were classmates of ours. And they looked like us and sounded like us. Um, and by the time we hit 100 employees, we had a lot of people that looked alike and sounded alike. 
And then, and then it becomes hard to attract people who don't look like you and sound like you and think like you. And we waited way too long to sort of wake up to the fact that, well, you make better decisions and you build a better, more inclusive company and you attract more talent by being far more diverse. So late, I would say way late in our life, in my life as a CEO, that I wake up to the benefits of having a fully diverse, uh, diverse workforce along every level. And we're much more diverse now. Like I look at HubSpot today and three of our board members are women, three of our C-level executives are women. 41% uh, of our employees are women, 42% of our uh, managers are women. And so we're getting in much better shape uh, and working on it. I just think we're a better company, more attractive to work at. We make better decisions. And uh, it's something I wish I did much, much earlier, actually, in our life, because it's hard to catch up. What happens is you get 100 employees, they all sound alike and look alike, and you're, you're a great black woman that we want to hire, and you come and interview, and your slate of interviewees doesn't look or sound or feel like you. That's a, hard, that's a hard road to hoe to convince that person. So that's been hard work and it's paid off, but uh, we woke up late on that. Okay. Um, and I wanted to ask you a little bit more about the kind of, you know, um, obviously there's a big difference between running a, setting up a business, being an entrepreneur, and then making the, the transition to a, a big listed company with, you know, road shows and, you know, yes. pesky journalists and all yes. the rest of it. What did the, <laughs> um, what, how did you find that transition? Um, uh, you know, have you, do you like it? I mean, or have you found it difficult? Yeah, here's how I think about moving from private to public. When you're a private company, you've got a bunch of venture capitalists on your board that own your company for the most part. They're all quirky, and they're all somewhat misaligned from you. And then you flip to being a public company, and you've got a new set of investors, Fidelity and whatnot, and they're all quirky and somewhat misaligned from you. They're misaligned in slightly different ways, but they're misaligned. And they're both fine. They both add value in certain ways. They're both rational and reasonable folks. The tricky part is when you have both at the same time when you go public. Uh, we're kind of through that, all the private money's out, and it's only public money. But I think the public markets get a bad rap. In fact, all my entrepreneur friends say, you're crazy to go public. Stay private as long as you can. I kind of like it. You know, I spend about two days a quarter dealing with the public markets and investors, which is about the same I dealt with when we were private. A lot of the overhead that you have to do to list publicly and the Sarbanes-Oxley requirements and all that stuff, people complain about it, but it's actually kind of good, clean living. It's stuff you should do anyway. Maybe you did it a little earlier than you would have, um, and it prevents you from making mistakes, and it protects your customers and your data and stuff like that. So I overall, I think going public is a good thing, and I think 2019 will be an interesting year when Uber pro probably goes public. Airbnb, Slack, some of these great United States institutions will go public. I encourage it. I applaud it. And I think the CEOs will, will like it better than they think. Yeah. Um, and um, I guess I just wanted to, to talk a little bit about the future, the future of, uh, of tech. Um, you know, uh, there's so much change right now. Um, it's you know, really invigorating to be in this environment, um, not just because it's traditionally invigorating in Helsinki in early December, but um, what are your predictions for, for 2019? What are the big themes that you see emerging? Okay, one of the things that, we, that, that, that I like about Helsinki is the first night I got here, I met my new friend, Robin. And we had a drink together at this restaurant. And this restaurant we went to had a sauna. And so we went, we took a hot sauna, and then we dove in the sea, very cold, by the way. We came out of the sea, we took a smoky sauna, dove in the sea and took another sauna. You guys have very unusual traditions here in Finland, but very nice traditions. Uh, I forgot your question. <laughs> <laughs> I was asking that was about lovely. you. No, was like, that's how I got to right. know Robin in, in, the, in what's this, the Baltic Sea. I got to know him in the Baltic Sea in December. Right. <laughs> and your predictions for 2019? Oh, predictions no? for 2019? Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I think this relationship between the customer and the, uh, uh, between the company and the customer I think the leverage continues to shift, that the customers get more and more and more leverage. I think more, you see, to, you know, a year ago, two years ago, you would buy something online for $100. You're like, okay, I'll put my credit card out there and buy something for $100. I bought a car recently for $80,000, and I bought the whole thing online, didn't even test drive it. I just think more and more things you buy, you're going to buy online. More and more of the information you need, you're going to buy online. Uh, more and more of what you're going to do is going to be automated. We do an interesting test at my company. 
uh, we let people come to our website and we have a chat pane on our website and you can chat. And during the day you chat with a human and at night we, we program a bot and you chat with a bot. Ironically, what we see in the data is people would rather chat and are more chatty with the bot than they are with a human. And so I think there'll be more automation and that automation will be good for, uh, for companies and employees. I think this trend of, of automation and self-service is here to stay. Millennials shop and buy in a whole new way, and businesses need to transform their go-to-markets to match the way millennials actually buy stuff today. Uh, for example, I'll give you another example. Like traditionally, if you've got a problem with your product, you would call the hotline and a, and a, and a vendor. You wait on hold forever. You talk to somebody. They wouldn't have the answer. They'd transfer you. You'd redescribe the problem. You'd hold online forever transfer you, and finally you might get an answer after you know, a day and a half of this. That's just not how people expect things to be done today. They expect to be able to go, go to Google and get your answer, be able to go to your website, chat with a human or a bot and get the answer. Worst case, pick up the phone and talk to a human, work through the answer. So I think this, the, 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 the taking the friction out of the sales and marketing process, creating more delightful end-to-end -end customer experiences, I think that's here to say, I think the leverage, the loss of leverage by companies relative to their customers is going to continue, and that'll be good for everyone because everything, every product I think over time and every service, the quality will be improved because the competition is so much higher. It's actually a really interesting time to be a buyer. Um, well, Brian, it looks to me like we're pretty much out of time uh, there, but um, I just wanted to, to Thank you uh, on behalf of everyone here, and uh, you know, best of luck for the future. Okay, thank, thank you, you very much. Thank Thanks, you. everybody. Thank you.